Crisis Day is a podcast from a female-founded destination practice that believes that crisis isn't an if, it's a when. We are an organization unafraid of crisis, but have never known one to be resolved in a single day. However long the day or night that gave rise to the crisis in the first place, there's always something we can learn. I'm Leah, the founder and CEO of Broadstairs Consulting, a problem-solving consultancy offering crisis and governance advisory services to help leaders and organizations thrive and flourish. We operate in the gap between legal and public relations at the coalface of difficult situations, believing that most crises are avoidable and the impact of inevitable ones usually can be mitigated. Our guests have overcome a litany of crises. Many of our guests have worked with us in some capacity in the past. All of them have stories worth hearing. We trust them to make this worth your while. We hope it helps you trust us. Today on The Longest Day, we welcome the Right Honourable Mr. David Lammy. David is from Tottenham and is now the Labour MP for Tottenham. He has been an MP since 2000, currently undertaking the role of Shadow Foreign Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs. David was called to the bar in 1994 and practised as a barrister in the UK and an attorney in the US. He is one of the leading agenda setters in the fields of social activism, diversity and multiculturalism. He led the campaign for the Windrush British citizens to be granted full British citizenship and has been at the forefront of the fight for justice for the families affected by the Grenfell fire. In 2017, David published the widely recognised review into the treatment of and outcomes for black, Asian and minority ethnic individuals in the criminal justice system. In 2020, David presented a TED Talk as part of their latest countdown series, calling for a global recognition that we cannot solve climate change without racial and social justice. Well, David, it's wonderful to have you on The Longest Day. Thank you so much for joining me. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for asking. So perhaps you might like to tell me about your longest day. My longest day, I think on reflection, and you'll understand that there are a few days in politics that can feel quite long, but the sort of stressful, intense longest day has got to be the Saturday in 2011, Saturday in August, first weekend in August, when what should have been happening is that Spurs should have been playing their first game of the season. They played that game, but then what transpired after that game was the beginning of what became known as the riots of 2011. That, of course, had begun with the shooting of Mark Duggan a few days earlier in Tottenham on Thursday, but then led to a widespread uprising, I think, in Tottenham, and then rioting across the rest of the country. And it was the longest day for me because... I can't tell you, it's such a, an amazing thing to represent your home, as I do, and not all members of parliament effectively represent the place they were born and raised. Uh, but if you represent Tottenham, as I do, if you know the people, you know the streets, and then you're, you can see on television, um, cars, shops being looted, a bus on fire, mayhem in the streets, and frankly, the police losing control of the situation. And your the name of your constituency and the image of your constituency no longer being about the football club and about something positive, but a sort of relentless negative story. If your phone's then ringing off the hook because... Uh, journalists, broadcasters, newspapers all around the world are asking for comment. And if actually physically the police are stopping you from being in your, I was in the constituency, but being on the streets because you, the MP can't be on the streets sort of conveying a sense of the streets being out of control, that would have to have been the longest and the most stressful of occasions. 
Was there anything that you had encountered in your career up until this point that could have prepared you for that Saturday? Well, look, I think that it turns out that at the time, a lot of commentators, constituents, others said, thank God David Lammy is there. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, because, of course, because having grown up in Tottenham, I had experienced the first set of rioting that there was in Tottenham that's talked about as the Broadwater Farm riots in 1985, which led to the catastrophic and tragic murder of a police officer, PC Keith Blakelock. Um, that, and, and it was a, a savage murder. He was hacked to death. Um, and I, I had lived through that, experienced that, understood the way in which that story connected to the current story in some ways. Uh, but also I had been in Parliament at that point for a decade. So I had, I was experienced. The Labour Party were now in opposition. I was an opposition MP. Um, and I knew I had a responsibility both to the Duggan family, um, who had lost a son in a high profile, controversial way. Um, I had a responsibility to my constituents, many of whom were just terrified at home and were not rioting. Um, I had a responsibility to call out those who were coming into the constituency to loot and cause mayhem. And I had a responsibility to try and articulate why there were now a copycat set of events happening across the country in places very, very different to Tottenham where people were rioting at large and straddling all of that alongside the thing that I had most in my mind was how do I support the victims of this riot? How do I support people who've been burnt out of their homes, burnt out of their shops, uh, people who are now suffering PTSD, people who've lost all their belongings, of which there were... Um, hundreds in my constituency that I had uppermost in my mind because I recall from the last set of riots that there are always victims and the victims can get lost in this nightmare that people are experiencing. How did you get through that longest day? What? <laughs> well, I, I happened to have at the time fantastic staff for whom I'm really, really grateful, none of whom any longer work for me, but all of whom came into work, um, sat in my house through the night, uh, many of them, um, you know, taking calls, crafting statements. Um, I was allowed to be on the streets um, as the MP on the Sunday morning. Um, after the initial mayhem. And that was very important. And I was the first politician really to sort of speak to the cameras about what had happened. And I think that was a sort of pregnant moment really for the country to try and articulate um, what had happened. Um, and there was some controversy about how my predecessor, Bernie Grant, had articulated the riots back in 1985. I must say a lot of that unfair um, uh, coverage of how he had tried to articulate what was going on in Tottenham at that time. And I just had great staff and, and you know, a lot of constituents ringing the office, of course, because they were in such desperate need. Uh, never mind, of course, the Duggan family who wanted answers as to why Mark Duggan had been shot and there was no gun uh, on him at the point at which he had been shot. It's almost one of those extremely complex crises because it's so multifaceted. What did you learn about yourself as you were st stepping into the public eye to respond to many of the interview questions that were put to you and to balance that care for the victims and also that pragmatism about how to move forward? Well, as I said, my instinct was to rush in very quickly. The minute the riots were taking place, my instinct was, right, I need to be in Tottenham, I need to be on the streets, I need to go and stop people, I need to go and be amongst my constituents. And I'm really pleased that I had experienced staff that stopped me doing that. Uh, it would have been a huge mistake. Um, 
as people were literally throwing Molotov cocktails at the police for the MP to sort of be in the melee of that, um, as emotional as I felt at the time. Um, so there needed to be some pause. There needed to be some reflection. We needed to understand how to use the media, both to convey, you know, I was calling for calm and for the rioting to stop. Um, the statement I gave on the Sunday morning when I did uh, uh, tour the high road was a measured statement. It was the right statement to make. I might not have easily been able to do that the day before. Um, there was a need for me to be a channel uh, of support. Quite a lot of charitable support came into the constituency. A corporate support came into the constituency, particularly to support the victims. Uh, there were quite a lot of important people from Prince Charles to the Prime Minister to the Deputy Prime Minister, leader of the opposition, who needed to sort of be in the mix. And I was able to marshal them into what was going on properly. Um, and um, there were some very heightened feelings in Tottenham and beyond, I think, in the black community and beyond because of the circumstances surrounding the shooting of Mark Duggan and marshalling that at the time was really, really, really tough. So it was a pressured environment. But I suppose what I learned was pause, experience mattered, an experienced team mattered. The comms did matter because the, I mean, this was global comms mattered com hugely. And, um, and staying the course because it was the case also when one looks back on the riots, that there were other very important people that sort of called it slightly wrong. The, the former mayor of London, Ken Livingston, didn't quite get the tone right at the beginning of the crisis, came under a lot of criticism. The current mayor, Boris Johnson, was absent and was pilloried when he arrived back in the country from not, this wasn't the people of Tottenham, this was the people of Clapham that pillared him and, and, and pilloried him and were, were really upset. Um, uh, senior politicians talked about feral sort of, you know, they, comparing human beings to rodents is never a good idea. And so, so there were lots around me actually that were not calling it right. And I think that there was a degree of authenticity because I was from the community, understanding, but pause, reflection, comms experience, and relying on staff, not just thinking I could do it all my own, that came to matter quite a lot. Are you feeling stuck? Has conflict got you down? Have you considered mediation? Mediation is a confidential and flexible way to resolve conflicts. 86% of all mediations end in a solution, saving time, money, and stress for all involved. Thanet Mediation Center, a Broadstairs consulting initiative, offers mediation services to individuals and organizations in Thanet, Kent, and further afield. For more information or advice, email us at info at broadstairsconsulting.com. We are here to help you move forwards. Is there anything that, if that were to happen again, that you would do differently? Well, um, I don't... I mean, I, looking back, I had sadly found myself also predicting unrest. Um, so people could look back on my record in Parliament and say, well, that's interesting because this member of Parliament was actually calling what might happen here, which helped. Um, I think also, you know, when I reflect, it was a incredibly stressful time. The only other commensurate stressful time for me was the Grenfell Tower fire in which um, not only was that devastating for that community, but I, I lost a very dear friend um, um, in that fire and felt caught up in that controversy as well. Um, so look, I, no doubt about it. I mean, I say to people that the, the riots sort of took years off my life. It was phenomenally stressful. Um, there was a lot of criticism of the policing of the rioting. 
Um, and the borough commander in Tottenham was away. She, she took a holiday. So the other thing was I came back from holiday. I, now I wasn't abroad, but I came back very swiftly. I knew that I had to come back and I knew it was my responsibility to stand alongside my constituents. And, you know, you, there has to be a degree of professionalism, responsibility that, that, that is important. I, so I think I got all those calls broadly correct. I, 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 um, and the thing that dominated me, I had an idea, I don't, I sort of didn't want stigma to attach to Tottenham. And I think we pulled it off. I think that 12 years later, um, you know, we, we, despite the hardships that exist in my constituency, we didn't have stigma attached to the constituency. I was in Detroit recently, which is an American city like Tottenham that's had successive riots. And, and there is a degree of, still of stigma and um the city is hugely underpopulated because because of some of the issues that 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 riots have brought about not solely but or exclusively but some so so i think broadly i i reflect and i look back and it's a uh, it, i i'm proud of the way that i and I really want to emphasize not just me my team behaved at that moment we talk about these events that are known to living memory in the recent past. Um, but they are harrowing and they are difficult and they are traumatic. How do you deal with the emotional toll of having to step into situations like that and be the leader that everybody needs you to be? Oh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I do. You'd have to ask my wife and she'd probably say very badly. Um, look, I mean, I, um, have a faith, a personal faith. I don't, I'm, it's not a proselytizing faith, but I do have a faith that helps me, I think, in part because I, I, for me, it's not all about me. I can sort of give it up to God, if you like. It's, 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 it, there's a, something bigger going on here that I can't control entirely. Um, I, um, I, I do take breaks out with the storm and, for me, that's being abroad um, during the holiday time, particularly. Christmas is a very good time to go away because people do actually take time off. And for me, my secret place of to get my reserves back is the Caribbean. Um, um, and I think perspective is really important. And when there's extreme crisis, you can lose perspective, either because you're tired or just because the nature of the problem is so big, you can just lose perspective. There you need staff, trusted staff. You need not not yes people, people who call you out, tell you things you don't want to hear, that you respect. Uh, some, in politics, sometimes you need the arguments in the room in front of you that you can see different people take disposition, then you can come to a judgment. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I... I also, you know, you know, wise counsels experience is important as well. And that comes from different places, um, mentors, people one's known, networks that are important to give you access to expertise and advice, I think. No, I think that's, I think that's really helpful. I think one of the things that leaders struggle to do is choose a team that is both good in peacetime and in a storm, if you could choose one character trait to epitomize the best team member in the crisis, what would it be? Well, uh, you know, loyalty is important People, because because it usually means that people are prepared to work long hours and really put their backs into it if they are loyal. But one of the mistakes I think comes up in politics a lot is recruiting people in your own image who don't feel emboldened to tell you things as it really is, but just to sort of, to, just to suck up, basically. And I think that's a disaster. And I, I found in times of crisis, particularly, that I'm very grateful that I have a diverse team, um, bright people, but people who aren't always going to agree with you. And, I, I, and feel emboldened enough to challenge, but respectful enough once the decision has been made. Um, 
so that that's a particular alchemy in politics that's important. But I think it probably runs to quite a number of organizations because um, diversity of thought in a crisis usually is really, really important. Yes, absolutely the way to prevent crises from turning into scandals. Okay, one more question for you. We're very passionate about food at Broadstairs Consulting. And if you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose <laughs> to fuel it? Well, look, you, you want um, food that's going to uh, give you fortitude for hours and hours and hours. So there is no better food than uh, Caribbean cuisine, <laughs> in part because it was fostered to keep people going as they worked on plantations. Um, um, so I, I am, you know, a bit of planting is always good. <laughs> Give you a sugar high, but it'll keep you going in the process. Uh, rice and peas is always good. <laughs> um, um, you know, ackee, saltfish, jerk chicken. Um, there's a long, long list of, um, of, of of Caribbean meals, but actually they're not that dissimilar um, um, from fufu or something you might get in in in, in West Africa that I I, I would recommend. <laughs> well. Uh... I can't disagree, and my Bayesian relatives would be absolutely thrilled. So uh, I'd be joining you uh, for that meal. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing Thank your insights. Thank you for insights. asking. Very, very good. It's, very it's kind really of happy. You. Really, we're really grateful to have you on the podcast. Thank you. You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next instalment of the Longest Day. Copyright 2023. Production copyright. Broadstairs Consulting Limited. All rights reserved.